All right, all right. Um, um, so, so a little bit of impromptu, bit of impromptu today. today. I had the day, had the day from off from work. work. Just reach out to Richard. Reach out to Richard. Hey, you want to do, hey, do a, a, a live stream on how to compose for the subcontrabassoon? Like, yeah, sure. Like, yeah, sure. Why not? Sure. Why not? And so, and so always are. happy to talk about things I don't know anything about. Yes, aren't we yes, all? aren't we um, all? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, though, um, though you're probably you're more probably qualified more qualified than anyone, than anyone. Uh, but uh, but um, yeah. So yeah. So we'll talk about we'll how to talk actually about how to actually compose, compose for the instrument, for the instrument um, that doesn't um, exist that doesn't yet. Exist yet. Um, um, so so I guess we may wait. I guess for we may wait for a few people more show people up. to show up. Uh, lots of uh, echo. lots of oh, echo. Wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Um. um <laughs> Let's see. Is, Let's see. Is, is, this any is this any better? I've uh, muted, I've, uh, my, muted uh, my, uh, my desktop, my audio. desktop audio. Uh, all right. Uh, tell right. me, guys. Tell me, guys. If that is any better, any on, better there? on there. Um, um, Richard, uh, Richard, I think, uh, it's probably, I think it's probably the echo may be coming uh, from your uh, end, from your end when you're filtering through my computer. Uh, shouldn't be. Uh, uh, well, I mean, just for for my software setup. Oh, okay. So, uh, hmm. Okay. Uh. Because I'm pretty sure my computer, like, literally can't play through the external speakers right, when the, right. when the headphones are plugged in. Still, um, still oh, 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 oh! I know, I it know is. what it is. Let's try that. It's my end. I bet that that's got it fixed. All right, are we any better? And remember, there's like a 30 second delay on this, so. But yeah, yeah, the, the delay, delay always, always gets, gets me. me. Yeah. I wish, I wish you, YouTube I, could could get that fixed. That that, that, darn, that darn speed, speed of light, light always, always yeah. causing, causing issues. issues. Okay. Uh, yeah, so all right, so we got it fixed now. Okay, cool. Uh, so anyway, yeah. Um, as I was saying earlier, I reached out to to Richard. We, I had the day off from work and uh, said, hey, let's talk about actually composing for this instrument that doesn't exist. So uh, here we are. Um, yeah, and so composing for an instrument that doesn't exist is, uh, is a little bit difficult. Um, so there's a few things that you know I as uh, the composer needs to know, uh, but uh, I guess we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so, uh, let's see. Really, look. I guess where's the first, best place to start? Um, well, for well, me, for I mean, I, mean, the, I think the, the, the most obvious place to start is, start is even, before even before you get, get into, into issues, issues like timbre, and balance, and balance and dynamics, dynamics. You have to you have to deal with simple, simple logistics. logistics. You know, you know, uh, you're, dealing uh, you're dealing with an instrument that not only, not only doesn't, doesn't exist yet, yet but, but is probably, probably never, never going, going to be particularly common. common. Right. So it's, so, so it's not an instrument you would score for in your run-of-the-mill high school junior high band piece it will never happen this is only going to be for something um maybe you know professional or for groups of enthusiasts yeah yeah yeah, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 analogy, the analogy I've, I've used, before used before is, is that, that if, if at some, some point, point 20, 20 years, years from now, from now the subcontrabassoon sub can, can is, is, has, has reached the level, the level of the, the contrabass flute, flute, as far as, far as being, able being able to, to, to be used, used then, then I will consider it a, 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 a success. That you know, would, you know, that would be pretty high praise because the, the contrabass flute, as is, has become supremely popular uh, in flute choirs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, and, you know, these, these you, know, you know, 
uh, situations, situations that are a little, little less formalized, formalized. You know, like, you know, like uh, the the. The orchestra, the orchestra is going, is going, to, going be, to be, you know, you know like, like a century-long century long ordeal. ordeal. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and, 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 and it, you know, and, you know, and it, there's, there's a decent, decent chance that, that it'll, never, it'll never, never, never actually, actually get to that, get point. To that point. So, so as, as a composer, composer, how do you, how do you? I mean, it, it, I mean, it, it, uh, it's the what I would consider one of the most difficult uh, challenges in uh, instrumentation is. Writing a part that's important enough to justify the use of a rare, uncommon, or not technically existent instrument, but not so important that it can't be um, worked around. You know, and the 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 subcontrabassoon has the additional challenge where, okay, you don't have a bass oboe. You know, there are other instruments that can do that or can play Those in that strokes, range and be yeah. a woodwind. Yeah, you know, there's the a... You can play the bass oboe's entire register. Yeah, bass clarinet can, uh, uh, e- even the tenor sax if you wanted to. Uh, but, you know, on the, the subcontrabassoon, that's really it. Mm-hmm. I mean, with the, with the exception of a, you know, million-dollar organ... And you know that's one of the the main reasons for uh, that I that I think the the idea of a subconscious tune has value is because it's unique in that register. But that also works against it uh, logistically when you're actually trying to or thinking about programming it right. or programming a yeah. piece that uses it. And and so you know with that, it could very easily be a hindrance to. Uh, a ensemble looking to program music. Um, if you put that in there, said, "Oh, subcontrabass, like, man, we're not playing that." Next. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think anyone who used the subcontrabassoon for several, for at least like the first decade, yeah. is going to have to basically know you treat it as an osia. Yeah. It you know, it it's very much going to be centered on your circle of friends uh, for the time being until a second, third, fourth, fifth instrument gets out there. Mm. And so the, yeah. there are these localized hubs of players, and that's actually what we see with any new instrument getting developed. Uh, back when I was writing the old Bandistration blog, uh, I had a series called What Do We Do With a New Instrument? And so I look historically at um, how composers treated uh, some of the new uh, exotic woodwinds as they were invented. Something like uh, the alto flute. Uh, alto flute's actually not a great example because it's, it's actually odd that it was invented in probably the 1860s, but it wasn't really used until about the 1890s for the first time. So for whatever reason, it just kind of sat there waiting. Uh, but Well, and, you know, the alto flute also was in a similar situation for decades where it was this, you know, absolute extravagance that, you know, you you had to deal with if you wanted to program uh, uh, Daphne and Chloe. Right. And where... Uh, if you did the planets, there's a decent chance you just skimped out and had them play the cues. Um, you know, because the, just the, like the bass oboe, there's uh, recording of Holst conducting the planets is like that. Uh, same with the bass oboe. There's no alto flute. There's no bass oboe in there. Mm. But. Uh, yeah, but something like uh, the heckle phone, uh, you very much see it in the early decade being used primarily in centers where they knew an instrument was. Uh, so a lot yeah. of dre- Oh, I mean, even, and, even if you go all yeah. the even if you go all the way back to the contrabassoon, I mean, there's there's a reason why so much music that uses the contrabassoon was written in the area of Vienna. Yes. Uh, 
That was uh, in, in the earliest parts because there was an instrument. Someone was someone was playing it, and they wrote parts for it, and those parts survived. Uh, yeah, yeah, and so you know we see uh, Bach with the the Saint John Passion. Uh, you know we know that he had a con- uh, contrabassoon there in Leipzig. Uh, we know that uh, Handel had a contrabassoon in London. In fact, that contrabassoon is still in use um, in, in Vienna. And those were really the only places back then you saw a contrabassoon. Paris didn't have a good working one at all. Berlioz talks about that. And so uh, you, know, you don't see contrabassoon parts in French music during most of the 1800s. Certainly not in the 1700s. Yeah, and, and you know... Berlioz is a kind of interesting example because it several times uh, it seems like a few times a season someone you know is talking to me and like oh yeah but we're doing Berlioz coming up you must be excited about that and I'm like no <laughs> he, he doesn't use contrabassoon no he used it tr- exactly twice in his career in his very early piece Le Franc Juge and I'm sure I butchered that um and, no one expects French to be pronounced correctly. No, and then again in the band piece, uh, the uh, uh, funeral and triumphal symphony. And mm. in that, yeah, so you know, it's two pieces awesome. that are never performed. The 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 funeral and triumphal symphony is probably performed more often just because it's band work, but it's always done like in a modern transcription. So, so, so like. That would be the the big logis- the the big logistics. Uh, you know, personally, I'm. I don't know. I, I don't want to get overly optimistic, but something like uh, like low budget film scores yeah. or video game music might be you know situations where it's kind of expected for people to record locally and then send it in. Uh, those situations could be a uh, good opportunity for the you know the the subconscious to break through exactly. uh to, you know to the point where it can actually be heard uh not not to where it's going to be common yeah and i actually think that uh you might see it in in video game uh scores or movie soundtracks more than you would actually on the orchestra state stage yeah it, it it also helps for an instrument and i'm sure we'll get into this later uh for an instrument that's uh balance uh concerns yeah uh being able to you know just uh let's turn that up or down you know let's just fiddle with this knob and fix it um whereas you know on a live orchestra stage it's kind of hard to tell everybody well we can't quite hear the subcontrabassoon uh even though this is orchestral fortissimo right. everyone just come not uh, hearing this and, and you know in some of those situations hearing the there's not really a satisfying solution other than you know isolating the the <laughs> Well, in, anyway, we're talking about things we don't know. Right, yeah. Yet, uh, it could be that you can actually belt out on it. So that's something that, you know, we is yet to be seen. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. Uh, want to be able to support uh, the full orchestra, though. And uh, I think that kind of goes without saying, because the contrabassoon can't. Yeah, it's, it's uh, and, and, you know, even, even the tuba, like... In the range in which the tuba can really punch through uh, a, a full orchestral tutti is not the the, the contrabass range. Right. Uh, maybe B flat, B flat one to F three is that punch range. Yeah, well, I mean, maybe even I I, I, still. I would even go higher than that. Like yeah. a a tuba a tuba player who really wants to belt out on some top of the staff notes they're going to be heard mhm that's why some of the, sometimes uh, if if uh 
if you're playing with someone who's maybe not quite as musically sensitive uh, on a part that was originally written for Ophiclide, oh, it can yeah. sound absolutely ridiculous because, you know, the tuba player's playing up above the staff and they've worked really hard to play these notes, um, but they haven't taken that extra step of saying, oh, this was originally for Ophiclide. This is not a solo feature for Altissimo Tuba. Right. Uh, and and that gets into you know what is the best instrument to to use uh, for those parts, but that's kind of not the the point of today's uh, stream. Yeah, yeah. So all right, you you and I going off on weird tangents. Imagine that. Oh, I know, that. I know. All right, so we do have some questions here in the chat. Um, okay, so let's go back a little bit. Um, so the. Alessandra asks, what type of music would the subcontrabassoon be best for? Um, and, and I, and I, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, yeah, go, what are, what are you going to say? I mean, I, I was going to say, I think that they're exactly correct. Uh, large, oh, wait, uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, uh, ST15RM yeah. uh, responded uh, with, with what I think is the, the most uh, reasonable uh, suggestion which is you know these kind of large bassoon ensemble um works where you know if you're gathering four contra bassoons and 12 bassoons in one place uh, yeah. finding a sub bassoon might be a little more uh reasonable right uh, you know so bassoon ensemble works absolutely uh and then he suggests the the Mahler style gigantic symphonies um the thing is those really aside from me aren't being written anymore um you know i'm, I'm one of the, the few people out there tr trying to to write those big long symphonies with lots of instruments uh, and i will tell you the the difficulties in getting that performed are immense mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean usually when uh Usually when orchestras are either commissioning or looking for uh, new works to perform, you know, they're they're being a little more conservative with instrumentation. Well, you know, they're, they're using They're being very conservative unless it's a huge name composer. Well, I mean, um, a lot of times the the pieces we we play in some of my groups, they're, you know, what I would consider a typical orchestra you know mm -hmm. triple wins uh Four, three, three, you know one brass yeah you know harp piano three or four or three percussion and strings yeah. you know i i don't think i think there are people that even, even in kind of like the well uh, anyway yeah so that's what i would consider a kind of a basic orchestra a, a group that almost any any group that can call itself an orchestra could put together that uh group of players right um it, and i know there, there are a full symphony orchestra and not a chamber orchestra because those will be function very differently yeah and chamber orchestras can actually be oddly difficult to to perform as well because a lot of times you're dealing with very difficult music Mm -hmm. And everything's exposed. Everything's exposed. And then, you know, logistically, you'd think it would be easier, but 15 or so players kind of falls in this weird middle ground where it's not really suited for a big hall and it's not really suited for the, the kind of smaller salon style concerts either. Yeah. Um, I know, uh, you know, the, the Tulsa Symphony, every season we, we talk about, okay, how can we perform some, some chamber works? Because musicians love chamber music. Yeah, it's, like, it's more intimate, and you get to communicate more with your peers. Yeah, and so, you know, we're always trying to figure out ways to do it, but it, it's... Just because there are fewer players doesn't mean the logistic issue. You just have different logistics issues. Right. And so on the 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 thread of chamber music, you know, there's a, there is a reason you don't see a lot of contrabassoon in chamber music. Uh, same reason you don't see a lot of tuba in chamber music outside of stuff like well, brass quintet. 
So on Contra Bassoon, I think a, a big part of the, the problem is a lot of times Contra Bassoon is played by people that you would not want to play an exposed part. Right. Now, obviously, there are so many wonderful Contra Bassoonists around, but the fact remains that as a composer, as an orchestrator, you can't necessarily rely on uh, your part to be played by one of them. Right. I mean, they're, they're, they're out there, they're not hard to find, but a lot of times it gets played by, hey, we don't have a third bassoonist, uh, we need someone to, to cover this part, um, hey, uh, don't you have, uh, you know, and they go to the first bassoonist and say, hey, don't you have a, a, a student? Yeah. Hey. Are, are, they, are they willing to play contra bassoon? And of course the teacher says, of course they are. And I say that from experience because I was once that, once that, uh, kind of completely out of his depth but too dumb to know it mm -hmm. student who you know just you know got hired to play contrabassoon because he knew the 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 prince and you know over the years I'd like to think I've overcome that but uh you know there's a there's a lot of years I was the sort of contrabassoonist I'm talking about yeah I, I was there, too, for a bit, uh, but I, I had made a, quite a bit of study of contrabassoon, too, So it, it, especially in grad school. Um, so, yeah, so with the orchestras, it will be much harder. I think, though, that with wind ensembles, wind bands, you probably will have a, a better inroad because there is a lot more flexibility there. Uh, particularly because most of the time you are going to be dealing with student groups. And so you don't have to deal with union rules uh, like you will with a professional orchestra. Um, well, the, the, I don't know that the union issue would be that big of a concern because, I mean, you know, it, it's not, it's fairly common for a large orchestra concert. You're going to be hiring subs. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, it would mainly just come down to the the availability of instruments. I mean, right now there's like 0.3 subcontra bassoons available, um, and uh, it's going to be a while before that changes. Yeah. So yeah, I I think the the uh, comment earlier is exactly right that it's going to need to prove itself in, in smaller settings where someone's not putting. A full orchestration on the line, on on it, whether or not they're going to be able to get a subcontra bassoon. It may be, uh, you know, something like uh, the virtual performances uh, mm -hmm. would be a, a good inroad there because you can see how it fits in uh, without you know having to go to a lot of expense. Yeah, the the only challenge there I I see is that. When you're dealing with an instrument so low, mm -hmm. live is going to be the way to experience experience it. Because, uh, you know, whenever you prepare music to be listened to online, you don't know what people are using to listen to it with. Right. Sometimes, you know, it's going to be a, a nice sound system with nicely balanced subwoofers and blah, 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 blah. A lot of times it's just going to be earbuds or... Right. Like and the external so, speakers on an iPad, even. Yeah. Like these earbuds, I would not want to listen to the subcontra bassoon on uh, because, um, uh, you know, it's it's too small. It can't reproduce those frequencies. Yeah, you'd be hearing like the 17th harmonic yeah. and higher. Yeah. Um. But uh, I think that kind of would lead into um, the fact that you have recorded a what, we, what we, we've kind of called the faux subconscious bassoon for my Symphony 2 project. Mm -hmm. um, so in my Symphony 2, um, it's, it's about a 50 minute long piece and the subconscious bassoon only comes in in the last uh, few minutes of it. Um, and... Richard did some experimenting and played the part and then just digitally altered it. Actually, you want to kind of go through how you did that? Yeah, so uh, the, the 
the best way I found, so I, I usually use Audacity for recording mm -hmm. because I'm a big fan of anything that's open source and free and capable. You know, I, I like to use software that can do anything, even if it's a pain in the butt. In fact, um, I'm using Audacity for the entire post-production on the project. Yeah, uh, sorry, I distracted by a, a human resources question on my phone. Um, yeah, so what I do, so Audacity has kind of three relevant uh, effects. There's the change speed, mm -hmm. uh, change pitch, and change tempo. Yeah. Um, what kind of the most obvious uh, approach would be just record the passage. And then you use change uh, pitch to take it down an octave. Uh, but what I found is that change speed or change tempo and change pitch both introduce a good deal of distortion mm -hmm. uh, because you know it's it's having to make choices. It's either arbitrarily chopping up or lengthening uh, what you perform. So what I actually do is uh, I take the click track and the uh, reference track. And then I uh, use uh, change speed to play that back twice as fast. Luckily, it's a very slow track that I had for you. Yeah. And then, so you're listening to everything at double speed, uh, twi twice the tempo. You record. I record the part on contrabassoon, and then I use change speed to lower at an octave and... Uh, lengthen it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you want to get specific, it does change the recording because all of a sudden you're not recording at uh, 48 kilohertz. You're essentially recording at 24 kilohertz. But, you know, the, the subcontra bassoon is so low that those upper harmonics that you're going to lose um, in that, um, that conversion aren't um, uh, aren't really terribly relevant or i wouldn't think they would be yeah so we're not, so that's, we're not w worried about the the upper harmonics there so much yeah that that's that's the best approach i've found even for even for pieces that maybe like let's say that it, if i've wanted to add a subconscious bassoon to something and it's just a like a low f or a low g mm -hmm. you know something that's not impossibly low i think I would be willing to bet that playing it on contrabassoon and mo mo taking it down an octave is going to be a more accurate, uh, uh, or I guess I should say a less inaccurate uh, representation. Yeah, rep representation of the sound as opposed to playing it on contrabassoon and you know playing like a low B flat on contrabassoon and pitching it down a third or a fourth. Yeah, and, you know, I, I, I tend to agree there. Like the, the first time during the, the subconscious project where I released some of these what i call sound tests where i you know just was goofing around with a contrabassoon digitally pitching it down first thing i did was, was i do this i did soon play play a passage on bassoon digitally pitch it down and then compare that directly to a contrabassoon so that hopefully anyone listening would you know understand that this approach is limited in how accurate you're going to get yeah uh, you know, I I, mean, I did I kind of did the same thing uh, years ago when I made the uh, the missing bassoon video that I did uh, talking about uh, what would eventually become the great bassoon, and I just took a regular bassoon recording and pitched it down at that time a fourth, a, a fifth I should say. I'd be doing a fourth today. Uh, no, Mason, don't worry about that. Uh, I'm adjusting some of the video settings with goes. Yeah, that's that's me adjusting it. Don't worry about it. Uh, uh, for whatever reason, Richard's window keeps uh, shifting. So, okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, yeah. So, 
I completely forgot where we were. Uh, uh, so the uh, oh, pitch shifting, yeah, yeah, yeah it, pitch but but getting into that, it was uh, kind of like the 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 digital, um, uh, yeah, uh, like the virtual orchestras, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, so I think what I will do now is I have queued up, and I hope this will work, and um. What I will do is I will um, I will mute Richard for a couple minutes, and then I'm going to bring up uh, the uh, some of the recording that I have currently of Symphony Two, uh, so that you can um, hear what it will sound like in context. And I'll give a little bit of commentary over it. And just uh, because of the earlier audio issues, I'll have to mute Richard so you there won't be any um, echo. Is that okay, Richard? Yes. Right, you should. I hopefully you should hear it too. All right. So what I'm going to try and do now is this is um, the finale of uh, Symphony Two. And this is the part of the virtual recording. Um, and what you'll hear is really only about a quarter to a third of the people participating. Uh, but listen down on the bottom and you will hear Richard's uh, faux subconscious in. Hopefully this will work and come through. So down on the bottom, the lowest note you hear is the subconscious note, or the faux one. listening to this on pretty good speakers. Um, I'm on the headphones right now and I can't hear the, the subconscious bassoon, which should be way down at the bottom. Yeah, B negative one. Uh, by the way, I, I, I can't actually hear this, but I you know yeah. recorded it, so. Yeah. yeah. You could if you were on the, the live stream. Yeah, but then I then I then I hear the audio like five, three or twice, and so I get you distracted. No, you guys are only hearing half the conversation because Richard's muted. Hmm. So I'm just gonna continue talking animatedly, like I'm saying something really important, and that way everyone's really frustrated that they can't hear me. What's missing from the context here is all the upper woodwinds should be playing at this point. But you can definitely hear... Oh, apparently they can hear me. Oh, they can? Oh, yeah, I'm glad I didn't take gonna... that opportunity to say something wildly uh, 
<laughs> inappropriate. Okay, so I'm just going to keep the, the this audio settings. So, uh, what you hear in just a second when the, the final chord comes in um, uh, is um, is the the lowest note ever written for an orchestral or a wind band piece, which would be the, the low B. At the time of writing, it would be anyway. Um, which I, 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 I might have to double check the, the exact time frame here because I know there's a German composer who used the subcontra bassoon in a piano concerto and ended the piece on an optional low A. Mm. So an optional note for an optional instrument, but I, I, I couldn't that off Matthias? the top of my head. Yes. I couldn't off the, off the top of my head swear which piece was written first yeah so uh so uh dibs you'll be able to hear it uh but you'll be getting an income the kind of the smaller the speakers are the more incomplete picture you'll be getting of the sound because you'll be losing more and more harmonics so on a, on a pretty decent sound system, you're going to be getting like the second, third, fourth harmonics. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of on earbuds, you're going to be getting like the, the sixth and seventh harmonics. And our brain's good at, you know, putting that together to the sound of a very low note. But you, you will be missing something uh, for, you know, not listening on the best equipment. Right. So, yeah, that's the, the finale of the symphony. Um, and you could hear that very last note uh, is the low B. And it, it will be that interesting just, when we get the organ part in there, too. So, so that note was interesting to record because, of course, I was recording at double speed on contrabassoon. So I had to try to gauge... Breathing twice as often as I might otherwise need to breathe uh, so that it doesn't, you know, it's not uh, impossibly, uh, I'm not playing something kind of impossible. And, you know, maybe I'll be able to circular breathe on subcontra bassoon, but I, I, I certainly haven't been able to practice that yet. Yeah. All right. So Mason asks, how virtuosic is the instrument? And... I think I would go out and say it's not going to be a virtuoso instrument. It's it it'll do. Well, it's not a virtuoso well. register. No, I mean like it there, can't. there's, you know, if you play something like, uh, I don't know, like a, like a, thirty second note scale in the low register of the subcontra bassoon. Even if you're moving your fingers that fast, even if the instrument is changing notes that fast, you're kind of limited on a. On a what, uh, how quickly you can actually register those notes. And I mean, at a at a certain speed, you know the sound that it makes when you take a roll of duct tape and you just go. Poor. Yeah, I do that yeah. all the time at, at work. Yeah, at, at at a certain at a certain speed, I think it's pro it might end up sounding something like that, where you can s tell that it's doing something, but it's not. Um, they're they're not individually perceivable as pitches, and I know there is at least one piece for subcontra bassoon that kind of runs runs into this issue, and uh, I, I'm personally viewing it as kind of like a like a tantrum, like an effect, yeah, like <laughs> rather than you know each note needs to be distinct because in that register it's not really going to at that speed right it it with uh what you just heard of mine uh, was the fastest note there a quarter note i think maybe there was an eighth note in there somewhere i feel uh, like there are eighth notes but i uh I, I couldn't i couldn't swear by it yeah uh i'd have to go get the score but it's in the other room right now uh but uh yeah, so that was uh, my my first foray into writing for the the subcontra, and in in that piece, it is absolutely Aussie. Uh, you could take it out, and it won't harm the effect of it. Uh, yeah, well. well, I mean, and personally, I, f I feel like 
and I mentioned before, this is a hard thing to do. I, I feel like you did a very good job of writing a part that is impactful mm -hmm. if it's there, but not, uh, but doesn't destroy the piece if it's not. Yeah. And that's really what you're going to need for something like the subcontrabassoon. If you write a piece where, you know, the subcontrabassoon comes in and plays some low notes at a full uh, orchestral tootie, and that's all it does, um, it's going to be, and, and you mark it optional, then that's going to be hard for, you know, people to justify it's like well, why are we going to all this trouble to find you know like the one person who can play this part and bring him in just to play this note that is scored so thickly no one's ever going to hear it right and this is one reason i use only use it in this final section which is pianissimo all the way through if not pianissimo um it give it gives it a little bit of sonic room to be able to hear that rumble um the the massive uh tutti fortissimo that comes a little bit earlier than this i i've thought about going back and adding um a subconscious part there but it's so loud that it wouldn't make much difference mm -hmm. yeah and i think that that that's probably as much as composers misunderstand the capability of the contrabassoon, I think there's a risk that they're going to misunderstand the capability or the what I assume are going to be the capabilities of the subcontrabassoon, which is it is a woodwind instrument. Yeah. I mean, you you do not write a full orchestral tutti and have one bassoon on the bass line. No. You it, know, that, it's, that, that's bad writing. Yeah, and I I think that you know, these smaller combinations of instruments are where the contrabassoon is most effective. You know, like when, when the contrabassoon can play a really low note, mm -hmm. not at blastissimo, yes. but as, you know, like a perceptible part of the chord that you can actually hear individually, I think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, the, I think the two best examples of... Uh, contrabassoon of that effect uh or the corral from brahms one and the corral from mahler two yeah and, and there's also uh there's, there's a moment i really like in uh, hindemith symphonic metamorphoses where it's just a low b flat sustained forever yeah um and but you can hear it it's effective um it's it's uh it's able to use its. It's written to the contrabassoon's strengths rather than its weaknesses, and so many pieces are written to the contrabassoon's weaknesses. Yeah. And you know, I think subcontrabassoon is going to be the same same way. Players or composers are going to think, if they're inclined to use a subcontrabassoon, they're going to think, well, I need to. I need to only use this in the biggest moments, right? It Right, and that's where it's going to have the least impact. Yeah. Like, the English horn player will be, you know, rattled, literally. Yeah. Um, but uh, maybe not so much uh, anybody else. Now, of course, once again, I'm operating under the assumption that... So when I designed the subcontrabassoon, I very explicitly designed it analogous so that its relationship to the contrabassoon is analogous to the relationship between the bassoon and the contrabassoon. So the idea being, I wanted a family of bassoons in octaves. Mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to build the generically subcontrabass woodwind. I, I might have done some very different things if that was the case. I certainly would have done different things with key work. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, honestly, if you were building a generic, if you wanted to make money building a generic subcontrabass woodwind instrument, you, you would build something with a single reed that's conical that has saxophone fingering. Yeah. Because that's going to sell. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, with, with a much more modest taper. Because, you know, you, you make a saxophone that size, the, the, the bell's going to be three foot in diameter. Basically, a two-backs. 
Yeah, but another octave lower. <laughs> right. Uh, so, um, but, you know, it's, it's kind of hard, hard to, yeah, so I, I, I am personally operating under the assumption, and I think anyone, com any composers that are, you know, inclined to explore the subcontrabassoon before it's done, which is something I'm not necessarily suggesting. In fact, Brett, I, I think in the past when we've talked about this, I kind of been on the side of. Well, that would be fantastic for me, but I'm not sure that that's right. You know, the the safest approach. Now, the advantage of you know uh, talking to and working with Brett is that he knows all that stuff. You know, I think you know there there are composers out there who would write for this bizarre instrument simply because they heard about it on the internet and they thought it would be cool. Uh, Brett, you're not like that. You know exactly the, the uh, logistical issues involved, and you're, you know, making a conscious choice to expand the palette of the the wind ensemble. Yeah. So what one thing I kind of uh, like to to discuss is I use maximal resources with maximum restraint. Hmm. Uh, in Symphony 2, there is... In, in reality, there is not a single note in the whole piece where every instrument plays at the same time. Mm. Uh, in reality, uh, there's two measures where everybody plays, and I'd leave one instrument out. And I'd leave out the, the tenor flute, the bass flute, because, well, it's not going to make <laughs> any impact. But it comes in at the very next measure solo. So, that's that's the impact, and that's something. Uh, the the older I get, the more I compose. I like going to more and more extremes, bigger, 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 and smaller, 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 and to juxtapose those against each other to get a much more maximal effect. So I mean, you could hear in in the sample that you heard how absolutely quiet and austere it is uh, and, and granted you're missing two-thirds of the ensemble but it's not going to be that different than what you heard you're just going to hear a lot more twinklies it, it is it is surprisingly difficult to pull off thick orchestration in a way that has Variety. I yes. mean, I, I would say very few composers, like even the best composers, very few succeed. You know, like some of the best moments of Strauss do, you know, achieve that, where you have very thickly scored passages where there is enough variety in how the instruments are used and how they're divided that, that, that it doesn't just sound like a big mash of, you know, in my mind, brown. You know, it's like... Yeah, like, Strauss like, is a fantastic example of that, and so I, I keep going back to the Alpine Symphony because even in a mass of tutti, every line is clear, and you still get the it's just like this kaleidoscope of color, and it's not everybody blending together. Yeah, yeah. The, in w one of the very rare situations in a musical context where blend is used as a as not the goal. Yeah. You know, there, it, there is such a thing as too much blend. You know, I think that a lot of wind ensembles composers, you know, they, they treat the, the wind ensemble like a, uh, like a really bad organist and they just go up and they pull out all the stops and then they play, play that. And yeah. they say, well, th this produces the most decibels. I'm happy with this. Yeah. And, and that's, that's uh, a, huge trend in a lot of band music is that you know it is constant tutti playing all the time and in such a case subconscious bassoon would be pointless in fact regular contrabassoon is pretty darn pointless and that kind of stuff um i mean back when i was playing much more regularly in a wind ensemble um one of the the best pieces i played on contrabassoon uh, we did the Hindemith uh, Kammer uh, the Kammer concert, chamber concert for organ and winds. I think it's number seven, and it's you know 
small wind ensemble, uh, cellos, basses, and solo organ. And absolutely great part. Great, you know, fun to play. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't played that particular piece. I have played a handful of... I mean, I, I don't play much with wind ensemble because, well, wind ensembles usually don't pay. And uh, I... Yeah. I personally, like, you know, I, I've been asked before if I would ever be interested in playing with, you know, such and such group. And, you know, for every piece like the one you're talking about, there's 20, you know, like, Susa marches or, you know, just, you know, newer yeah. music where it's, you know, just everybody playing for Tismo all the time. I find that my, you know, we were talking about Strauss earlier, my favorite uh, orchestrations are the where they take the slightly easier approach to to not sounding like a big mesh, which is they, you know, they use smaller combinations of instruments and save Tutti for kind of yeah. rare effects. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what I find most rewarding to play. I mean, you know, Strauss. Because that's how good orchestra music works. Yeah. Yeah. You look at well, Mahler. Ma oh my God. Mahler is giant chamber music. It's all that is. Mm -hmm. Th there's so few tooties in Mahler. I mean, it is all just this intricate, delicate, diamond-like chamber music. Yeah, there, there, there's a reason why contrabassoon audition music is full of, like, these little, like, five-bar contra solos. Mm. Uh, yeah. from Mahler, just because, you know, he... That's all there is he, for Contra Solos, really. Yeah, yeah. But... So, with the Subcontra Bassoon, I, I, I do think that for anyone who does want to compose for it, that is the, the right approach, is using it in smaller situations where it can be heard, can be appreciated but could also be missed. So that might mean, you know, playing in octaves with the uh, the contrabassoon, you know, an octave it, lower than the contrabassoon. And that's going to be probably the most common thing to do is contrabassoon and subcontrabassoon in octaves. Yeah, and, and you know, there's nothing necessary there's nothing wrong with octave doubling. Uh, you know, it's a uh, it's reinforcing the harmonic series. Yeah, and, it, and it's... It will make the, the subcontrabassoon slightly more potent. So, uh, so Aster says uh, they like the sounds of the more unusual instruments and see them used a lot in a large section, but is there an effective way to write for these timbres without being a massive ensemble? Yeah, uh... You know, there there is one piece that I, I keep coming back to simply because I'm so excited to actually perform it one day. And uh, a, a German composer named Matthias Hutter wrote a a essentially an uh, a nonet mm -hmm. for strings, double reeds, including subcontrabassoon, and uh, it's. Uh, The, the upside is you're going to be it's going to be a great way to experience the uniqueness of a new instrument. The downside is you're adding a unique instrument and, you know, it's not optional. You know, it, it needs to be there. And combining that with the already existing challenges of performing a chamber, uh, a piece for like a largest chamber group. Yeah, you know, like usually when chamber, uh, when chamber music is performed, as in people are paying for chamber music, it's something small like a you know quartet, a trio, uh, something like that. Once you start getting into ten or more players, it becomes pretty difficult to program. Yeah, I could see it. It if we just stick to something like a smaller wind ensemble, I could see it easily going into something along the lines of the ensemble that uh, Mozart would have used with the Grand Partita. So that kind of 12, 13, 14 player range for just a, mm -hmm. a wind ensemble would be great for like a, a wind ensemble concert. 
to bring it out for that small chamber piece and then um, you know take it off stage when you perform the big piece yeah yeah uh, well I mean it, you know those those sort of pieces are the most rewarding to play on contra bassoon so yeah. it, it wouldn't be uh, crazy all right I, I would expect that to be reward, the most rewarding pieces to play on sub contra bassoon as well um, so the uh, ratchet kind of brings up the the approach or the issue we've been dancing around how do we know what the balance is going to be like and uh, the, the truth is we really don't uh, I personally don't see much much reason to worry that it's going to be too loud yeah oh yeah no it, I don't think I don't think physics will allow it to be too loud unless we hook you up to an air compressor. <laughs> you, 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 you joke, but I, I, in the back of my mind, I do have, I have thought about... Are you about, trying to think, reinvent Samuel's Era 4? No, no. I was thinking more of a Giga Crumb horn using, using one of my Giga reeds on like a... a, a 40, 40 foot piece of PVC pipe with a, you know, kind of put a bend in it and then hook it up to an air compressor. <laughs> the only thing that would make that funnier is a flamethrower at the end. <laughs> yeah, well, or if the neighbors, you know, run inside because they think it's a tornado siren. Yeah, which there are three tornado sirens in Symphony 3. Or Symphony <laughs> 2, I should say. Which is one of the reasons I didn't put uh, 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 the subcontrabassoon in the, the earlier section, in the, the Massive 2D, because I've got air raid sirens going. Yeah, uh, so someone brought up the, the use of the kind of the, the low, like contrabassoon and subcontrabassoon with the low flutes. And I, I do think there's a, some interesting possibility there for... Because once you start getting to the extreme depths of sound, I, I do think that they're like very low contrabassoon and kind of mid-range flute can have a nice uh, nice effect when mm -hmm. combined together because the, the, the lowest range of the contrabassoon is not terribly bassoon-y. Yeah. It, it's, it, it's, it's kind of weird because the, the lowest range of the bassoon is kind of like the most reedy, the most bassoon-y. Whereas the lowest range of the contrabassoon, I would consider kind of the, if played at a, you know, uh, piano, I like a comfortable piano, yeah. is among kind of like the most fluty. So there could be something there. Um, of course, you're you're taking a kind of uncommon instrument like the the, the bass flute. And combining it with an even more uncommon instrument, so there there's that challenge. But if you know, I I twenty years down the road, if the project is a success, I would not be at all surprised if that combination shows up in a film score or two. Yeah, you know, I, you might assuming have we've up. reached the point where some of these, you know, like one or two L.A bassoonist has gotten a hold of a sub contra bassoon and there's actually people to play these parts yeah or they just may force you to relocate to la yeah i don't i, I yeah i don't either i've my I've my, been to my, LA my entire lifestyle depends on uh being you know uh, living someplace that's ridiculously cheap to live yeah <laughs> i don't Boy, think i, I would that. do well in la or new york or no. somewhere uh, no, I've been to L.A. twice, and no, sir, I do not like it. Yeah, it's always hilarious when people in northwest Arkansas complain about how bad traffic is. <laughs> oh, wow. You you clearly have not left Washington County in decades. Yeah. Yeah. But... Uh... Yeah, so it will be it will be interesting to to kind of figure out what kind of instrument combinations will work with it. Obviously, the the 
the most frequently done thing will be just to kind of double the baseline an octave lower. So it'll double, you know, contra bassoon an octave lower, contra clarinet an octave lower, tuba an octave or two octaves lower, double bass, something like that. Um, um, you know, one one effect that so when I was goofing around with some of these like digitally faked sub contra bassoon passages. One passage that I didn't expect to work well, but I actually did, or that I, I felt did work well, was kind of doubling with our, like a solo passage with a wide gap between. Yeah, um, yeah I remember that, that one on the, the video you did. Yeah, where you, you're not, if, if you had just played that sub part down to low A, it, it would have been... Without training, like without, for someone who does, didn't have experience playing a very low instrument, they would probably just hear that is, right? Yeah. But uh, all of a sudden you add something just, you know, like a few octaves higher in a comfortable tenor register or low bass or bass register, um, that gives your ear enough to latch onto so you can hear those those extraordinarily low pitches even it gives you a way to hear hear those pitches more distinctly as in not just a color of the contrabassoon passage uh which is what i think is going to end up sounding like you know bassoon and contrabassoon and octaves is you know it sounds like a like a bassoon sound, like a bassoon section. I think contra bassoon and sub contra bassoon octaves are going to be the same thing. Right. They're going to color, or the sub contra bassoon is going to color the bassoon or the contra bassoon, but it's not going to be really apparent. You add a little more space between those those lines, and uh, I think that there there is potential there for some not solo usage, but the uh, kind of solely usage. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I I never envision uh, subcontra bassoon as a solo instrument. Uh, solo in the fact that it alone would carry a melody. Uh, it alone maybe carry a long low sustain note or mm -hmm. a pedal point passage, but I don't foresee it much as a melodic instrument. Yeah, and, and you know that's something we're gonna ha that we're really only gonna have to we're gonna find out later when yeah. it's actually ready because you know like I think we've talked about this before. One thing that I'm interested to find out about is you know people think of the subconscious and they think oh you know low as possible. Why why would you ever use it if you're not writing the lowest possible notes? Right. But you know just like contrabassoon. There's a lot of value the contrabassoon can add in kind of the the tenor register, where you're still playing a fairly low note, but you have kind of the the richness that comes from playing in the mid tenor register. So it's kind of like you know on bassoon, if you if you're playing down in the low B flat, you're you're limited on uh, expressively because you're playing at the very bottom of the range of the instrument. You take that up an octave on contrabassoon, all of a sudden you're a little more open. You take that up two octaves on contrabassoon, and you know if you've worked through the challenges of the instrument, uh, all of a sudden there's uh, a lot of potential for this. I mean, there, there's a reason why a lot of the the contrabassoon solo work kind of features this tenor register. It's not just you know five minutes of fast scales in the, you know, below bass clef. So I am interested to see what the upper register sounds like. So like, let, if you had a solo passage fr from like, I don't know, let's say high G down to, to tenor B flat. I mean, that's within the range of the bassoon. That's not yeah. impossibly low. Uh, it's certainly going to sound different than the same passage played an octave lower on contra bassoon or two octaves lower on bassoon. Uh, and it might take a generation for anybody to practice the instrument enough to be able to play it convincingly. But I, I do wonder if sometime down the road there might be 
value there might even there might even be situations where someone might say well this is a solo passage but it would be so low on contrabassoon it's going to be better if i give it to the sub contrabassoon yeah because they're playing in a more comfortable register a more flexible register now once again that's best case scenario like 20 years from now so if you're writing a piece right now and you decide to use a subconscious soon, you're going to want to be conservative. Yeah. And, you know, there are... In the history of music, we only run across a handful of composers who are ever writing for instruments that don't actually exist. Um, you know... You know, we know that at some point you will probably finish the contra subcontrabassoon. Um, <laughs> well, well I, I, I just bought a I just bought a very expensive uh, tool to help, so yeah. I need I need I need to finish something. Otherwise, uh, I've spent a lot of money for, <laughs> yeah. for nothing. Yeah, but um, you know, the only other composer I can really think of who is writing instruments that he hears in his head is Richard Wagner, uh, particularly with the, the, the Wagner Tubin. Yeah, but but even there, he was writing for... He wasn't writing for kind of a new register right. of he the just, orchestra. He wants a, a sound bridge. Yeah, like, he, he, he was writing parts that could be played by other instruments. Right. And the only reason they weren't played by sax horns is that he just ended up not liking it off sax. Otherwise, it would be, you know, four sax horns and not four Wagner tubas. Mm. Uh, but but then what would tuba players fight about uh, as far as nomenclature on the internet? I, oh God, I Are, don't know. The sax horn's not a tuba? <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. You know. So, well, yeah. well, the, the, the most, the most, uh, the heated discussion seemed to always focus on Chimbasso. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any. Oh, because so, there's two different instruments that are called a Chimbasso, so. Yeah, and there's, you know, there's no net indication that some of the composers that used it were thinking of necessarily either of them specifically. Right, yeah. So, but that's a, that's a, a tangent that's, you know, for Yeah, another time. tangent. Yeah, but uh, yeah. So some takeaways here. Um, it's probably n not going to take off in an orchestra anytime soon. No, uh, orchestras are far too conservative with their instrumentation. If now, now what one 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 opportunity is if anyone gets a commission to write a piece for the Tulsa Symphony or the Symphony of Northwest Arkansas, let's say five years from now. You might want to check and see if they, you can use that. Yeah. Because, I mean, there are weirdo orchestras that have instruments. I mean, you know, uh, the, the best example is the Montreal Symphony is getting through, yes. adding two more octo bases to their already existent octo base. And if you're writing a piece for that symphony, you can use octo bass. Yeah. There's not, you know, it's, they they've got their three there now. Yeah, I, I I don't know what they use them for, but you know they're there. Yeah, I, I I'd love to see them start commissioning more works for it. Which if they do that and uh, other orchestras want to play them, they're going to have to start commissioning octo bases. Yeah, well, I mean, I I think probably what would end up happening is they just you know tell the the fifth chair bass player uh, look just just t tune down your tune down a minor third yeah uh and just play the part it's it's not going to sound the same but it'll all right it's not going to be as resonant but you know at least we're playing the part mason they have three octo bases not two three have, have this have the other two been delivered yet yes they have all three okay now. yeah well that's just when people retire, that means they're going to have to have octo bass auditions. Yeah. How do you have an How do you have an instrument an audition for an instrument that you're the only no one, one else has. gets to yeah. play? I, I don't know. Maybe I mean I get. Uh, who knows? It may yeah. be one of those that 
they have to have an apprenticeship system that you get <laughs> into the double bass section and then you apprentice on octobase. Mm. But who knows? It's, it's bizarre. Uh, and, and the thing is, you know, they, they are only tuning them down to A, so they're not adding that much of a range. Yeah, and if, if you listen to, like, there's some, there's actually some excellent videos out there of the, mm. the, the guy, uh, the, the Montreal Symphony's principal octobassist, um, you know, playing some pieces, and, you know, even down to that low A, you can tell that it's, it's kind of pushing the instrument. Yeah. You know, there's a reason why it was originally designed to play down to the contrabassoon's low C, because right. those notes sound pretty good. And they, they sound, you know, better than the corresponding notes on contrabass that, you know, we normally hear played on, you know, an acoustically undersized instrument. Right. So being able to hear them kind of more fully resonated is great. Uh, but uh, the uh, the A tuning is, gives it a little more justification to exist because, mm -hmm. let's face it, orchestras and composers are not going to jump through hoops to write for octo bass unless they can get some extra benefits. some extra right. range beyond what's available on a modern bass with uh, C extensions. Even if even if it doesn't sound, you know. Even at the, and, and I think bass players would agree here, those lowest notes on the C extension, they're not great notes. No. You, you're not, I, I wonder if the octobass's real benefit is added power. Well, and that, and, you know, there's, uh, the, that same guy I was talking about, he uh, recorded some excerpts of the, uh, from Verdi Requiem. Mm -hmm. So the part that he was actually be playing with the symphony, and it was very interesting on how they use it, because it's, it's exactly that. They're taking notes like a low G on contrabass that, you know, is getting down to the bottom, towards the bottom of the instrument. You know, it's not the, the yeah. best range, and they're giving it some extra power, some extra oomph, you know, on the... Uh, and that... That's great, uh, but you're you're right. It doesn't it doesn't add a whole lot of extra range to the bottom of the string section. I'm like a con sub contrabassoon where you're adding a full octave below what even like the Montreal Symphony's octo bass can play. Right. Like the Montreal Symphony's octo bass goes down to A zero. Sub contrabassoon will go down to A negative one. It's uh, it's a rain. It's a register that I simply don't think would be. It it's not a reasonable register on uh, most families of musical instruments. No. Like the tuba can theoretically play those notes anyway, but no one does because they're so wild and unpredictable and you know borderline unplayable. Uh, strings, I mean, an octo bass is already giant, and, you know, adding another octave below that is kind of crazy. Yeah, because at some point you are starting to encounter the limits of uh, material science. You know, I can't remember, are, is the uh, Montreal octo bass in gut strings? I believe it is. Yeah. Uh, or at least it originally was. Um, I don't know if they've stuck with that. Because, you know, so, so every once in a while you find um, videos of someone playing a reproduction octobase and they use steel strings. Right. And with those steel strings, they're able to, you know, tune all the way down to, to, to C0 right. and That's the, the, get the a Arizona sound. Instrument. Yeah, it gets a sound. It's it's not an orchestrally useful sound uh, because it's an octave lower than it was built to play, but you can do that. You couldn't even get those notes to produce a sound with gut strings. I personally wouldn't be surprised if the, uh, the Montreal either has switched to custom steel strings 
or custom, you know, metal strings, traditionally manufactured strings of whatever alloy or whatever, or if they don't do so in the future, just for reliability and because I mean, there's a reason the contrabass and the cello don't use gut strings in traditional usage. Yeah, uh, it, it they're so expensive to to make. I, I, the orchestra, the Agent of Lightman, has a video. Uh, where they're talking about the, the Baroque double bass. And it says it basically takes an entire herd of sheep to make the low E string. Mm. Um, anyway, but we've gotten off on another tangent about the octo bass. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, but, you know, so, so. It's, it's not so much of a tangent as that it's, it's a parallel instrument. It, um, uh, what's interesting though is uh, I don't know how much uh, you've looked into something like the new violin family uh, yeah the, the, the violin octet right well I've, evidently it's been expanded now to a non-at um, Robert Spear who man manufactures most of the instruments has a sub contrabass that he's added that you know, in one tuning it, the lowest note would be A and then in another tuning the lowest note would be G so if you want to tune it in fourths or fifths, just depending. So uh, essentially the, the Montreal octo bass range. Exactly. Just it's a giant double bass, um, but, you know, playable with normal technique. Yeah. And, and that, that would make it, that would make a huge difference. Cause that, that is a one advantage the subconscious soon is going to have over like other experiments like the octobase is because of the way that woodwinds are controlled, you can play it in kind of the same fashion. Right. Like, you know, the keys are physically larger and heavier, but not, I mean, even sub keys are in the realm of like Barry Sachs keys as far as their physical size. Yeah. Um, so. I mean, you said the biggest one's what, 72 millimeters? The the pad cup seventy two millimeters for a seventy millimeter pad. And that's a, that's a. I mean that that that's a size that pad companies have in stock. Yeah. I'll put it that way. That that, that is not something that I had to go out and get custom manufactured. That is something they had you know just oh you want some seventy millimeter pads let me open this drawer of seventy millimeter pads and here you go. Yeah. Um. So. It. Like you don't have to worry about sacks. yeah you don't have to worry about those technical challenges the same way you would if you're writing for the octo bass where it's an entirely different technique you just have to worry about okay if i write a trill in this register is it even going to sound like a trill or is it just going to sound like you know yeah I th i'm going to take that sound and we're going to sample that <laughs> and that's going to be the new hip hop album. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you can run into that issue even in uh, Contrabassoon. Yeah, you know, like uh, <laughs> uh, you know, low trills. Most low trills are, of course, you know, awkward and almost unplayable on Contrabassoon anyway. You take a D to E trill. Yeah, it's easy, but won't sound good. Well, yeah, I mean, my as a performer, my solution, my thought would be, okay, what's the context? What's going on? If it's like a full 2D, then whatever. You know, just play it at a normal trill speed and, you know, be done with it. Um, sometimes the move, the excitement of the movement is more important than uh, the actual sound. Um, but, you know, if it was in a solo... I would slow that trill down. Yeah. Da, do, da, da, da. You know, not not literally as fast as I can play. Right, because uh, you have to let the note speak. Whereas on, on bassoon, especially a lot of times on trills, you eventually make to make it to you're eventually limited by the literal speed that you can move your fingers. Yeah. You know, like uh, in even on smaller instruments, even more so, where there might be situations where you'd like to troll faster, but you know you're just that finger can only mo move so fast. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, case case in point, when, when you start getting into the way of physics, in, in Symphony 2, I have a passage in one of the sections where I have the three bassoons um, playing in minor thirds, so diminished chords, uh, and they're all flutter-tongued. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I performed all three bassoon parts and I I play it back. It's like, oh, you can't even hear the flutter tongue because it's down in the bottom register. You know, you start getting, you know, the flutter tongue matching the, the vibration. Yeah. And, and like low B flat and low B on contra bassoon, like it, you get some really weird effects with flutter tongue because it yeah. is almost exactly the same speed. So you get this like really slow vibrato, whoa, 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 as the as the the tongue goes slightly in and out of phase, or as the flutter goes slightly in and out of phase with the note itself, you know. So, I, I if the project is a success, I would probably think that at some point someone's going to write a piece with like a low B flat flutter tongued on it. And I'll play it for them, and it's like, okay, there it is. Well, I did it. What what it could be though is that since the flutter tongue will be so much faster, you <laughs> you've kind of gone past it. You've gone yeah past like that the, island the, of stability. That that the the old timey wagon wheel has stopped, and now it's turning in the opposite direction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um. But I think once we start talking about, you know, flutter tongue to subcontra bassoon, that's a... Yeah, getting into the realm of extended techniques, uh, I mean, there is absolutely, you know, no answer to any of those questions. Yeah. Like, what's the upper range of the subcontra bassoon? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, I know what I'm building harmonic vents for, I, but... I have a feeling you'll be able to get up to you know, high F, an octave above where you've designed it. Yeah, well, and, and you know, like, the Contra Bassoon can play, play much higher than it was designed. Like, I'm doing something that the Contra, contra Bassoon doesn't have. I'm I'm putting an actual third harmonic vent yeah. on the Sub Contra Bassoon for hopefully to go up to C. Uh, but harmonic vents are always kind of a, you know, a guessing game anyway. Well, not guessing, but you do some math, and you then you try it. Experimenting, yeah. And then you change it because the math will only get you so far uh, yeah. on on all aspects of woodwind design, but especially harmonic vents. Yeah. Okay. So here here's a funny thing. Uh, Xander asked if you could play giant steps on it, and I think it would be highly ironic. Giant steps on a giant instrument. Yeah. I don't think you're going to be able to play it at tempo, though. Yeah. Well. Because remember, the original pianist on that album couldn't play it at tempo either. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that that would be that oh. would be interesting. Okay. Or you know, we got a new you could new all... person in the room here who's uh, who says that you're going to kick his ass. Wait, what? Uh, I had to uh, the message. For oh. <laughs> We're calling subconscious. So that is one interesting aspect of very low instruments is it becomes it becomes easier to play really high. You know, like yeah, something like something like the the piccolo or the sopranino sax or the E flat clarinet. You're you're kind of fighting for every semitone. Uh, whereas like. Uh, Contrabass clarinet. There are yeah. people that you know can play like five octaves on that thing. Yeah, Jason, uh, Jason Alder is a good example there. He's um, he can do five and a half octaves on three different models of contrabass clarinet. And you know, like even the even the contrabassoon, you can get a pretty decent. I I would say the kind of the extended range of the contrabassoon is easier than bassoon. Yeah, you know, like so. If if I had to play a high G on bassoon or contra bassoon, and my job depended on being able to do it, I'd pick up the contra bassoon. Yeah, unless you can R. Yeah, yeah. Some of that's just practice, but uh, but uh, you know, if if uh, 
if Christian had uh, spent the time on Contra Bassoon that he has spent on Bassoon, he could probably play like six octaves. I think he could play six octaves on regular Bassoon. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there there is some potential there for some really, really yeah. bizarre high harmonics. I mean, imagine um, Rite of Spring on Subcontra. How <laughs> strained and primitive that would be. Uh... Uh, I, 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 I don't want to imagine that just at this moment. You're going to, though, and it will haunt your dreams. Uh, man, that, that solo is hard enough to play on contrabassoon, like yeah. in the sounding octave. Right. Like, I mean, on a regular contrabassoon, it's just barely possible. And, and it sounds terrible. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, you know. It comes out on, on Contraforte in Fast System pretty well. Yeah. But... Now, now, I but, you know, say you're talking about, like, a newer piece where it's not, okay, play this melody five octaves above the range that you're supposed to be playing. It's play an obnoxious squeak. Yeah. You know, that is something, some place where I think that the, there probably are some interesting resonances... Uh, just, just based on the layout of the harmonic vent system, uh, that uh, you know you could probably squeak out some in tune, awkward notes on the subcontra bassoon, uh, as long as you you know don't expect them to be well in tune or have a good timbre. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so a Google Bell asked, uh, how would multiphonics on subcontra sound and Using contrabassoon as an example, they may not, because contrabassoon is surprisingly multiphonic lacking. Yeah, well, I mean, there, there are a handful. Uh, so uh, the thing with contrabassoon is the tone holes are more saxophone-like. You know, they're short, they're, they're perpendicular to the board. Um, so the best multiphonics on contrabassoon are the ones that use uh, tone holes that kind of deviate from that. So the wing joint tone holes are a little bit longer, and especially the C-sharp tone hole is quite a bit longer, mm -hmm. uh, smaller and longer than it otherwise would be, simply so that it's not so that it's in a reasonable location. Uh, on the subcontra bassoon, I, the original design, I did model it on the contra bassoon, where the C sharp tone hole was undersized and uh, kind of repositioned uh, with a with a long riser. But eventually, I realized, or I decided that there's no justification for that on the contra bassoon beyond that's where it needed to be. Yeah, that's where is, that tone hole needed to be. Is that what so? Uh, on the contra bassoon, it's been so long since I've, I've played contra. Uh, right next to the bend. Yeah, it's uh, it's this tone hole right here. Gotcha. And yeah, ideally, it would be like right up here. Uh, in fact, one of my one of my uh, favorite memories from visiting the Fox Factory is um, uh, Chip Owen. We were talking, and he just opens up a drawer to find something, and in that drawer, he has like eight different uh, small bins for contrabassoon, where he had experimented with putting a tone hole on the bend itself. So, yeah, this tone hole on contrabassoon is undersized and repositioned for uh, uh, kind of uh, re to, to, for practical purposes. Uh, on subcontrabassoon, that practical purpose didn't exist, so I... I made that kind of a, a more normal sized tone hole in a more traditional place. So yeah, I would expect multiphonics on subcontra bassoon to be even more limited than contra bassoon, which, as you say, is already uh, more limited than bassoon. Yeah. So Mason asked, uh, how, how many pieces are are in the the subcontra bassoon repertoire now? Uh well, so there's a there's a uh, th there's it depends on what you mean by that. Now, I think in a kind of like the most the strictest definition you could come up with is 
published pieces. So how many people have actually went to a publisher and said, this has a subcontrovasin part. You need to you need to make you need to make this. And as far as I know, there is one. Uh, well, I'm probably not going to be able to find it immediately, but uh, uh, Christian did an arrangement of a uh, of a uh, uh, Russian octavist hymn oh, yeah. that included an, an optional subcontrabassoon part. So that's kind of the strictest definition. And then if you go all the way down to you know like the the various you know emails I've got of you know people sharing their their work. Uh, with me, which, you know, I love getting, by the way, uh, you know, it's probably more like 20. Yeah. And then, and then you know, I think you and um, uh, Matthias Hutter are kind of the uh, right up there of uh, people that have actually used the subcontrabassoon in serious music that... Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, I well, know, I've got two pieces, and is Matthias about the same there? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because because he wrote the nonet and he included it in a um, a piano concerto. Yeah. Uh, the piano concerto is optional though, right. and I on one of your pieces is optional as well. Yeah, symphony. Uh, so <laughs> symphony three, it's not optional on mine. It's, I haven't really, haven't really talked about that because, you know, I've done a lot on Symphony 3 in the past year or so. But Well, you, you've been busy getting Symphony 2 virtually performed. Right, right. And that's that's been about two months I've been working on that. But there's also a Symphony 4 that happened in between there, too. Um, mm. But, which doesn't even have Contrabassone, surprisingly. Mm. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, so, betraying your roots. You no, know, I wanted it to be the most marketable symphony I could do. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, no. Sim symphony three's subcontra part uh, is much more extensive, um, and there are absolutely independent parts to it. I mean, there's one part for two contrabassoons and subcontrabassoon. Yeah, I think that, I think that I, yeah. I sent you a recording of kind of a mock-up of, or actually, I think I put that on my YouTube. channel. Yeah, it's channel. on your YouTube channel. It's just this rich, chocolatey gurgle. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good word for it, gurgle. Because what was it? it was down in like the, the low E flat, D flat area, yeah, right? Yeah. I have what wasn't there with the four bass clarinets and great bass and contrabass clarinet. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Two bass saxes. Uh, did you say two bass saxes? I think so. Or is two berries, a bass, and a contra? It's something like that. I, uh, I don't know. You know, it, it's frustrating because bass sax is. There is a bass sax in town, and I've never got to play it. Oh yeah. I've I've played with it. Uh, yeah. Uh, trying to trying to tune tune to that thing, was uh, not fun. Uh, was it uh, getting kind of funky? Yeah, well, I think like low C sharp was like forty cents out of tune that or something, about right, yeah. and uh, it, it was forty cents flat. Oh, and which... the soon players don't like flat. Oh wait, no, I can't remember. It might have been. I can't remember. Yeah, I I'd rather play flat than sharp any day. Really? Or I if I had to tune down or up, I'd rather tune down. Mm. Because oh, in tuning it, down, yeah. well, in, in tuning down, you're opening things up. You're, uh, it, it's easier, I feel, to get a good sound when you're tuning down, when you're yeah. having to bring things down, Instead of having to pinch. than trying to pinch up. Yeah. Just, bassoon just naturally plays sharp, though. Yeah, well, it, it, it depends on reads. There are definitely players, you know, with some setups. People yeah. that naturally play uh, a little on the flatter side of it. The big issue with bassoon, and even more so on contra bassoon, is that the instrument is not as well in tune with itself as yeah. uh, 
some of the other instruments. Now, the advantage is that with the double reed, we have a lot more flexibility than you have on clarinet and saxophone. So we can make some of those changes. It's like Which if a note on clarinet. have a tuning slide or any kind of tuning yeah. mechanism. Yeah. Well, and, you know, like uh, if a clarinet is, tw- if a, a note is 20 cents flat or 20 cents sharp on clarinet, I mean, that's like unplayable. Uh, but, uh, you know, on bassoon, we deal with those notes all the time. Oh, yeah. That's just typical F sharp for us. Yeah. And, you know, like contrabassoon, uh, contra even more so mm-hmm. because the instrument is not manufactured to the same standards as the, you know, top professional bassoons are and i don't think that's unique you know i would say that you know most bass clarinets are not made to the same standards as the 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 best clarinets and i guarantee you the prototype subcontra bassoon will have a lot of out of tune notes because once again math will get you part of the way but it's not going to get you all the way right yeah it's same same with the the great bassoon uh when i get that done i mean i I've done a lot of the math on it, but I know for certain that it's not going to be perfectly in tune. Yeah. But so, no bassoon is perfectly in tune either. Yeah. Well, woodwinds are always a compromise, but yeah. we, we, we would prefer if bassoons were a little less of a compromise, and contra bassoons even more so. The, the advantage... So, a go-go bing, brings up brass instruments. Mm-hmm. The advantage with brass instruments is... The out of tuneness tends to follow patterns that you can recognize. So you know you know that certain valve combinations are going to be have a certain tuning tendency, and you know, and you can even change that tendency based on how you set up the valves, uh, the valve slides. You know that certain partials are going to have tuning tendencies, and some and. Yes, you have to think about how those interact with each other, but there are patterns. Woodwinds are just, you know, like... There's no pattern. Yeah, you know, this note's flat, this note's sharp. Maybe they're a half step apart because uh, an octave higher, they're the opposite direction, and you need... And if you if they weren't out of tune in that direction, they would be even more out of tune in the opposite direction up an octave. Yeah. So it's... Uh, it's definitely a different challenge to play a woodwind well in tune. Astor asks, how do you calculate the acoustics of these instruments? And it, that is a long, drawn-out process that involves a lot of math. Yeah, and I'll be perfectly honest, I will consider doing a tutorial on my process after I... And able to gauge how well my process worked. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think it would be very responsible because, you know, I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a physicist. I'm not even, uh, you know, someone who studies acoustics seriously. Um, so and that I said, the sun to... is the most complicated of the woodwinds acoustically. Yeah. By a long shot. Yeah. So I don't think it would be honest to to go through a a big tutorial on my process until I can play an instrument and say, okay, this is an instrument I made with this process. And you can judge for yourself whether or not it's um, whether or not, you know, this is a process you want to use. Now, I will say that the. The people that do know a hell of a lot more math than I do, uh, and you know the, who, whose work I try to build upon, uh, they end up with you know some of the same situations where you know like, well, this note's twenty cents off of what we would predict. I don't know why. Yeah. Yeah, in th- this case, the math only gets you so far. We're not. It, there's so many different variables that are at play here. And, and everything interacts with everything else. Yeah. Um, you know, that repositioning that C, low C sharp tone hole is not only going to change uh, low C sharp, it's also going to change low D and low E flat. Um, right. And um, 
you know that that's one of the reasons why you know it'll if you're definitely change the the high uh, A flat. Yeah, it, it, which is why if if you're a bassoonist, you're probably have been frustrated by the out of tune low D, and you know it's not that manufacturers don't know about it or that they don't care. It's just overall it makes things worse to fix it in the obvious ways. Yeah. It, you would need to do a, a redesign, basically. And most bassoon players are not uh, conducive to that because it would mean relearning the instrument. Yeah, and I, I think that there's a middle ground here. I, yeah. I, think, there's, I think people have gotten kind of this... Uh, there's for, a conservatism. For, for, yeah, there there is a conservatism, but there's a lot of the uh, attempts to improve the bassoon, talking about like the late 1800s and early 1900s, a lot of these attempts kind of started from this idea of, well, we can all agree the bassoon is horrible, so let's completely do, redo it. Yeah. As, you know, and I think players were kind of right to, to react to that, Whoa, 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 whoa. There's a lot we love about this instrument. You know, we we want to... And I think there's a, there's a lot of players out there who would welcome improvements. Um, even if they had to relearn things. They just want to make sure they don't l lose. Like, I mean, I, I play bassoon. I, I use uh, flicking to, you know, get the tenor register notes to come out. Um, I'm not terribly interested in something in a spending a lot of money on a bassoon that fixes flicking because for me well it's putting a band-aid on the bigger problem well, yeah and you know i've i know how to do it and a lot of the the attempts to fix flicking are you know, require adding a lot of complicated mechanisms to the bassoon. And I'm not I'm not convinced for me that it's worth what you pay. Uh, what you know what what it costs, both musically and, you know, financially. Yeah, because it's on the, the attempts to put it on. Yeah. On the attempts to kind of fix the bassoon early on, you know, you were drastically changing what a bassoon was and what it sounded like. Yeah. With the benefit of making the fingerings easier, which for me, I, I don't know. I, I guess maybe I'm, I think there's a lot of people out there that maybe they're not woodwind players themselves and they assume that the fingerings are the most difficult thing we do. And it's not. Um, you know, like, yeah, there are bassoon fingerings that are awkward and uh, weird and unintuitive, but there are flute fingerings that are awkward and weird and unintuitive, too. Um, you know, more intuitive than bassoon, but yeah. still, you know, inle unless, like, no flute player is sitting around thinking, okay, I need to play an E6, so I need to finger an E4 and then vent at the fourth harmonic node by lifting up my left hand three finger. That's, but that's literally how I learned the upper register of flute. So, it's how but, you learned it. Yeah. It's how you learned it, but no one, right. once, you, once you play it, it's just muscle memory. It's just memorization. You know, it's like... Mm -hmm. Having played the bassoon for decades, I don't remember, okay, high B flat is one, two, one, two, four, A and C sharp key, and, you know, this random combination of, uh, I just, that's what it is. It's, it's that combination of fingers. Um, and it's not as important, once you've jumped past that initial hurdle of, and I wouldn't even say learning it, of just, I don't know, I don't know what the right word is then, so I'll, I'll go with learning. Uh, once you go through that initial process of learning it, then 
whether or not the fingering is intuitive or not doesn't really gain you a whole lot. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, let's say that a bassoon had a, you know, the, the old Baroque fingering for C sharp, you know, one, two, one. Yeah. Um, let's say that that was, you were able to design a bassoon that played that fingering absolutely perfectly and you could use it in all situations. That's not an intuitive fingering, necessarily, at least compared to other woodwinds. Right. But it would be fantastic. You know, it would be mechanic. The D above it would be out of tone. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, you know, I, your goal on woodwinds isn't necessarily intuition. It's, uh, fluidity. It's, it's ease of movement. You know, like it may not make sense to have two keys next to each other, but if those two keys are, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the, the apocryphal story about the QWERTY keyboard, that it was specifically designed so that, uh, in an unintuitive way for practical reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To uh, slow you know, down typists who were getting through with their work too quickly. Well, the, the story I normally hear is that they were ty that they were uh, typing fast enough and jamming keys. Oh. I think both. Yeah. I think both stories are apocryphal. Yeah. But you know, sometimes it makes sense for two finger or two keys to be in weird positions, if that finger that plays those two keys doesn't need to use them in at the same time. Yeah. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So Aster, yes, I do think it would be worthwhile to completely change the fingering system for the Ophiclide, but for what purpose? And I will say that actually brass players tend to have an easier time with the Ophiclide fingering system because it's not, it's not designed from a woodwind point of view. Yeah. It, I, I understand the off the fingering system. I don't like it, though. So, so, so dibs, my, my, my argument would be, so if you take, if you assume that we have an, a, a woodwind instrument, so dibs was talking about, you know, the, the thumb issue on bassoon. So if we take a woodwind instrument and we say that it needs to be able to play a perfect fifth below its fundamental range, so the bassoon's fundamental range goes down to low F, and then we take for granted that it needs to be able to play down to low B flat, what's the better option? I mean, your pinkies are, I mean, usually, like, at least for me, two keys is enough for pinkies. Right, um, and, so, and then we take a look at clarinets, and when we do the same thing with clarinets, it's six pinky keys for each pinky. But even then, you have to add thumb keys. Right. So, like, I, I my argument would be, what's the better solution? Like, what, what part, which fingers are not in use that have the same dexterity as the thumb? And there, there's just not one. And I think part of the reason why the bassoon uses thumbs is actually how it's held. If you look, think about the bassoon, it's held with the weight resting on the first finger of the left hand. Whereas on clarinet, the weight's resting on the thumbs. And because the weight's resting on the thumbs, it's less likely to be used. However, when you change that to bass clarinet, you've got the weight resting now on the floor, and the thumb is now free to use. So, uh, trying to, this is going to be crazy. Going back to the subcontra bassoon, the, uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, nominal, uh, topic of this stream. Yeah. Um, one comment, uh, that I, that I actually really enjoyed, uh, from, from someone in the early days of the project was, you know, essentially saying, well, why don't you move? I, th I think their specific argument was, to, to switch the low B flat and the low A keys so that the thumb would play 
D, C, B, and A, and then the pinky would play B flat. E flat, C sharp, and B flat. You know, a more intuitive system, right? Because you have your your naturals here and your sharps here. The 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 difficulty there is it creates some. So imagine, oh, what's it? I had a really good, I, I, I had what I thought was a decent argument in favor of the traditional system beyond just, well, it's what bassoonists are used to, and you'd need a really good reason to change it. Um, and I'm trying, trying to think of what it was, but, uh, oh, okay, yeah, so it was like, So, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to imagine. Yeah, I, I'm thinking that too. I was like, you know, that's not a bad idea. You know, I'm thinking about so, the great bassoon here. So, uh, okay, now it's going to drive me nuts. Hold on. Okay. Uh, I mean, you, you, you can go ahead and talk. I'm going to try to look something up. Uh, I mean... Because... I did come up with a a justification for why I but now I cannot for the life of me remember what it was cuz cuz it had something to do with like um So, A to B. There's no way to go for B flat to E flat. I think that I, I think that was exactly it. Yeah. That if you're going to have a a difficult or an impossible slur, it makes more sense for it to be A to E flat, a tritone. Yeah. Than low B flat to low E flat. Yep. So. The, the the point being that sometimes the the most intuitive system is not the best system. You know, if it means that you can't do something you used to be able to do, and the only benefit is that it's a little bit easier for someone who has never played a bassoon or a contra bassoon before, that's not that's not a good trade off. Yeah. Uh, Sorry uh, for blanking on that. I don't know why I decided. Yeah. I'm going to bring up an example, but not remember the actual point. Yeah. No, but th that makes it. It's something I've actually never thought about before. Is uh, putting the the low B flat for the the pinky key. I mean, if you do it, and if it's like my bassoon, where I've got the the low, my low D flat key will operate D flat and E flat. Um, it would work totally. It, but you would need to have a slightly more complicated mechanism for the D flat and E flat. Not impossible, but totally doable. Okay, okay. Duplicate keys have been tried on the bassoon. Uh, the the most famous example is the Cucireano system, and I'm sure I'm butchering that because it's Romanian. And <laughs> uh, but what they uh, what uh, Professor Cucireano did is he took uh, there's four different improvements, and I actually have a couple of them on my bassoon. Uh, but the the most noticeable are uh, for the right thumb, an extra low D and low C key just above the pancake key. And they bridge across the bass joint. And yeah, I've... so so thummy passages give you other options, or even things like low C to low D trills, or mm -hmm. low uh, B to C or B flat to C trills uh, become more uh, useful, right? Or become more playable. Um. I'm not opposed to duplicate keys. You know, I play Contra Bassoon, which, you know, has two E-flat keys, and uh, my bassoon has two roughly equivalent A-flat keys. Uh, 
in two quite different F sharp keys that you know you can't really be used in a du as duplicates as pure right. duplicates. Um, the um, it's not the most uh, comfortable thing for me to you know kind of like you know that clarinet skill where you think like five notes in advance to figure out which fingering you're going to have to use for this note because eight notes down the road there's you know this other note right. And that that always throws me off when I'm playing clarinet and I can get one of those passages and I always forget <laughs> about uh, one of the the keys. I can't remember which. It's it's usually the, like the long the long F C key. Well, I I hardly ever use that. It's I, it's typically like the right hand F sharp C sharp that I forget. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I'm, I I don't play much clarinet and I'm not good at it. And I never that, said that I was whole... good at it. That whole skill set's kind of uh, not part of my repertoire. Like I, I, I still, even on contrabassoon, I slide my thumb more than I should just to, you know, play play notes with the most uh, comfortable fingering or the most automatic fingering. Yeah, that's so so natural to bassoon players though to slide fingers, and yeah. clarinet players are always taught not to do that. Yeah, well, I, I still think it's a good idea not not to if there's a better way. Mm -hmm. But if if it requires you know five minutes of planning, or sometimes on the bassoon, there's just not a better way. Yeah, you know, like it, if if you're playing a like just a moderate tempo. Like as a solo, if you're just playing tenor or half whole F sharp G sharp A sharp, you're gonna slide your, your pinky there. Yeah. Right, because you you want the best in tune F sharp, but there's only one real fingering for A sharp, other than the you know the, the stupid fingering that's useful precisely you know once in a career. Right. Uh, and there's no benefit to using the thumb G sharp because that would put you further away from the fingering for A sharp. So yeah, sometimes on bassoon you have to slide, whereas normally on clarinet there is a way around it. The exception would be depending on the exact mechanism, like some of the bass clarinets or basset horns or contrabass clarinets with the, you know, the, the low C sharp, low C, low D stuff. Right. There are some slurs that are just not really practical on some instruments. Mm -hmm. And then there are certain passages uh, involving the E flat key, E flat, A flat key. Uh, yeah. That if you don't have the duplicate, our slurs are impossible. Oh well, yeah, like you know, low E flat to low A flat on like a, like just a regular run of the mill bass or alto clarinet. Right. You know, without the the, the fancy key work. Yeah, I, I would think any any clarinet that has a low E flat or lower would have to have the alternate E flat A flat. It should, but doesn't. Yeah, but um, clarinets and again, we're yeah. off in the weeds. Yeah, so you know, on subcontrabassoon, when I was designing it, I purposefully kept the key work pretty simple and similar to contrabassoon, um, or you know, virtually identical to contrabassoon. But um, you know, there there are going to be some awkward slurs. You know, like. Uh, I'm not going to have an alternate E flat key on the prototype sub contrabassoon. So slurs from C to E flat are going to require sliding the third finger. Yeah. But I have a feeling that'll be probably one of the first keys you add back on. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I do have a design for it. Because uh, I've, I've talked about this before, I didn't want to design key work in such a way that these that some of these keys couldn't be added. Right. Uh, um, you know, it's easier. It's it's not ridiculously hard to add a key, but when you start talking about, well, I have to move this key and completely reconceive this key, mm -hmm. then it becomes, uh, you know. Uh, a uh, nearly insurmountable obstacle, yeah. you know, without without just building a new instrument. So, so Jared 
uh, is saying that the best arrangement of keys is the clarinet family. More power to you. I <laughs> it, it's clarinet key work is not for me. I will say it's better than oboe key work. Yeah, oboe key work for oboe players typically hate their key work as much as non oboe players. Yeah, I think so. Every time I pick up an oboe, it's like every key just feels like it's in the wrong spot. And that the you know the key touches all always feel a little undersized. I don't I don't mind undersized. Like I think it's something I've talked about before. I if I were designing a sub bassoon with only myself in mind, I would have made the key work even smaller, even closer together. Um, just you know, I, I feel like on most contra bassoons, the key work is needlessly far apart mm-hmm. and needlessly huge. And I so I don't I don't mind the small the small stuff. It's just like every key is that a weird weird place on oboe. Yeah. But again, we're we're way off topic from composing for the instrument, but you know, we've yeah. also been talking two hours now. So Yeah, it's kinda of hard I not think, to Yeah. So so Brett, as a composer, if uh, some other composer were listening to this and somehow made it through to the end, what would be the advice you would have? We even be more generic than the subcontrabassoon. Writing for an instrument that is in the early stages of actually existing. I would, number one, be in communication pretty regularly with the person building it, finding out as much technical information as possible. Uh, I would... There are some things that you simply cannot teach at this level. Uh, You have to be able to form in your mind's ear uh, an understanding of what the sound could and should sound like without actually hearing it. And that, I think, is a very difficult skill to learn. Uh, I, I don't know many people that can actually understand that kind of concept of being able to mentally hear an instrument that doesn't exist. And yeah. Now, the one advantage of in this situation is if you are in touch with the compose or the person building it, there is actually room to say, let's say that you were a recard, a modern day Richard Wagner. Mm-hmm. You can just say, uh, actually, I'm going to need this a little bit louder. Please, please change your life's work for me. Yeah. Um, most Honestly, unless John Williams starts writing for octo contra clarinets or sub contra bassoons, I don't think that that's a reasonable situation for anybody these days. But uh, right, I'm kind of in the the weird position as a composer where I can I can dream up these sounds, and I've spent enough time doing some instrument design that you know, well, I mean. I've got a great bassoon sitting right here. So, I mean, you know, I this is a, a, a sound that I've had in my head for years, and I'm holding parts of a prototype. Uh, mm-hmm. None of these parts will be in the final design, of course, because there's still a lot to do and redesign it. But um, I am, I think I'm very unusual composer in that regard, in that I... I very much see musical instruments um, like crayons in the crayon box. Um, you know, when you were a kid, what size... You might crayon... not use the white crayon very often, but you want it to be there. Right. Well, it's not only that. It's that when you were a kid and you got your pack of crayons, did you want the 8-pack or did you want the 64-pack? Or did you really want that 128-pack? Oh, surely they have a 512-pack by now. Oh, I, I, mm, I don't know. It's probably a lot of duplicates at that point. But, I mean, it's like, oh, I got crayons. Oh, I got a 64 pack. You know, it, it, so I, I like having all the options there. 
even if I'm not going to use, you know, silver very often. Mm. You know, I, I'm very much, you know, I think in terms of a painter on the palette, you know, you want all the colors there, you know, you know, just want this small little spark. And, and I think that, you know, the, the challenge would be, you would need to be a little bit open-minded or you would need to understand that the piece might be more difficult to pl- or to to play for absolutely people that don't have that and you you'd have to be willing to make that uh to pay that price yeah because it is like if you this doesn't just inc- go for the the instruments don't just e- exist yet but you know basset horns uh bass oboe you know if if you include those instruments you are going to pay a price in getting it getting the piece performed that and, and, that's simply unavoidable yeah and that's whether or not one reason that my music is not performed as often as i would like to i i have not gotten to the point where i want to sacrifice my um my vision of these these colors that I hear in my head for more access to playability. And maybe one day I will, but I, I love playing in a sandbox full of all these colors. Hmm. And not cat feces. Because that's typically what you find in, in sandboxes. But I digress. Okay, sorry, sorry. That took me, that took me a while to make that connection. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I... No, 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 it's fine. All right, well, uh, so if Jared's still in here, uh, Jared, do you have anything to add about the uh, the Octo Contra clarinets? He hasn't commented in a while. I'm, I'm not sure if he's still here or not. Uh, that, 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 that very well may be, I mean, but I figured I'd give him the opportunity if he was. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I I don't... I'm, I'm trying to think of anything that we didn't really talk about. Um, the uh, I, I, I still think the, the the biggest challenge is writing parts that are disposable but impactful. So, do you have any any advice for for that? I think in the early stages, I think that's probably the case. Um, you want a part that will add some if it's there, but not take away anything if it's not there. And you walk a fine line there. Mm. Um, uh, I, I would suggest use it in more quiet moments than loud moments because you think about where it's going to make the most impact. Um, and I think think about that for any instrument though not just a subconscious it where is an instrument going to have the most impact um yeah. you know it's it, like if we imagine a world in which the contrabassoon like if the contrabassoon was you know almost non-existent you know like a few people had one like the you know the crazy people's the crazy people, and if you were going to write for it, what kind of passage would you write for it? You know, the temptation would be a self-defeating passage that's just like completely superfluous, yeah. right? But but that also challenges. Okay, so why why am I going through why am I going through this trouble? You know, um, you know, imagine some you know orchestral composer wrote an optional contrabass flute part in their uh, piece and only used it uh, to double the bassoon. I have run across pieces like that before. Um, so, for instance, uh, uh, Camille Sasson in his opera Henry the Eighth has a part for E flat contrabass clarinet, and uh, that's what it was called at the time. Contra alto hadn't been invented, uh, and it plays a single uh, concert low G in like act one or two and that's the only note it plays in the whole piece and it's doubled with the double basses and i think contrabassoon which would have been sarusophone at the time so it's not ever going to get heard and so are you going to play it no you're not 
Um, another... Well, it, it, it depends. If because sometimes there are rules in place that the, the orchestra or the production company, you know, that essentially say if the part is written for, we have to hire. So the question w wouldn't be, are you going to leave it out? It's yeah. that are, are you going to perform, are you going to program something entirely, a completely different piece? You know, like I have been on uh, programming committees where the decision on whether or not to program a piece has come down to, well, that has bass oboe, and that doesn't. So, yeah. Um, but you know, for that, you know, Sasson at least marked it as optional, which I think would take some of that out of the equation. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think even in those situations, even in those situations, if a part's explicitly marked optional, it's it's okay to yeah. to lose because the composer's right. saying you don't have to have this. Right. Uh, another one is um, Zanar Donai's uh, uh, Francesca de Rimini. And there is, it's from like 1910. It, there's a bass flute part in it, of all things. Uh, he it was writing for the old Albisi phone. And there is one small passage for bass flute in this piece. And it is completely doubled by the cello section, which means you will never hear it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's now, so like in my mind, what would be a much uh, better approach to that would be kind of like the the planets approach, where you say, okay, here is the the bass flute passage. I'm going to put that in the cello part. I'm going to put that in small notes and say, play in absence of bass flute. Right. That way, the part is covered. If, if the bass flute isn't there, mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to have the librarian, you know, run out and scribble in other people's parts or make copies. You know, it's already all there. Right. And uh, if the instrument is available. So, I mean, let's say that it was just like two flutes in the low register, alto flute and bass flute. You know, that could be a very nice effect, even orchestrally with the right accompaniment. Um, where... Even if it was just for like you know eight measures, the bass flute could add a lot. Right. Um, but the moment you double it with another instrument, uh, you know that's that's going to cover it up. You you're arguing against yourself. You're arguing for. Well, I want this instrument, but I'm not willing to. I'm not willing to provide a framework for that instrument to be successful in the orchestra. Right, yeah. Um, there, there. I've seen lots of self-defeating self passages like that, um, where you score for an obscure instrument, but you never once hear it. Yeah, well, I mean, as a contrabassoonist, that's a decent part of my job, is playing self-defeating contrabassoon parts that yeah. exist because the composer thought, well... A real orchestra has a contrabassoon, so I'm gonna I'm gonna include a contrabassoon part, but I don't know how to write for it, and maybe maybe I've had bad experiences on what contrabassoons sound like, so I'm just gonna double it with everybody. It's like okay, I mean I'll play it, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of some others, but uh, um, Schoenberg's uh, five orchestral pieces and the contrabass clarinet there. You're never going to hear it. The part's almost completely doubled. You Plus, mean the contrabass clarinet in A? a? Yeah. <laughs> Which, okay, why? But he at least corrected himself in the only other time he used it and wrote for contrabass in B-flat. And that part is absolutely audible in the um, Opus 22. The four orchestral songs. Cool piece, by the way, if you don't know it. The Schoenberg Four Orchestral Songs. One of the movements is like four bass clarinets and contrabass clarinet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, it, I live in Arkansas. We're, we don't play much Schoenberg over here. No. Uh, unfortunately, you know, when, when you play in kind of the... The, the per-service orchestras that have like an eight-concert season, 
you're mainly playing the hot, the the big audience friendly pieces over and over and over again. A lot of Brahms, a lot of Beethoven. A lot of Tchaikovsky, um, I bet. Yeah, well, I mean, I I don't play those concerts because you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, some Strauss, but you don't do much uh, elsewhere. Uh, you know, I, I I will say though, here lately we've been doing a better job of. Um, you know, there's an uh, Arkansas connection for Florence Price. Yeah. So Arkansas has been kind of towards the forefront of getting her, her orchestral works uh, performed after a, uh, a long absence from the, the stage. So, yeah, and that, that's a, a, you know, a great thing that, you know, orchestras are doing. And I wish more orchestras would do that is champion some of their their local composers especially uh, minority composers and women composers yeah well i mean it it's 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 a hard issue because you're kind of at the whims of what the audience wants right and the audience wants what they've been told to want for a hundred years and it's you know, when, when you're dealing with composers that were unjustly ignored, and then you, you take that a couple, gener- or a couple generations down, the initial impetus for the, you know, the pieces being overlooked originally are gone, but they haven't, they never, they were also, they were robbed of the ability to build up that organic, um, interest from the audience in, through that process. Yeah. So it it's it's not it's not the simplest solution in the world to just say, well, we're going to program more works by you know uh, uh, women and minority composers when you know you're working you're working under a model that says okay you're going to perform you know a brahms a beethoven a strauss because that's what the audience wants and the audience in this part of the country can support like eight concerts a season it, it it's a it, it's one i am i agree i'm i'm very glad orchestras are trying to fight through trying to work out a solution to to be better at what they do while also you know keeping the audience surprisingly i think that what orchestras are doing during the covid lockdown may actually improve some of that because they are having to reach out and do a better job of communication and do a better job of marketing with people that aren't just the you know the longtime patrons the people you know and, and I don't want to be dismissive, you know, because, you know, so much of orchestra is dependent on, you know, these, you know, patrons that have been listening, you know, their entire lives. Uh, but, yeah, it's yeah trying I, to trying to branch out from them to build bridges to the new generation that is not is rightfully not going to put up with concerts full of 100 year old dead white guys. Yeah. Um, and trying to build bridges between those groups is it, it's it's a hard it's a hard nut to crack. And we're we're the orchestras are just finally starting to even try, which I, is the first step to succeeding. I think uh, the orchestras will uh, do best if they actually invest more into their marketing department and the marketing department not to necessarily sell tickets but to actually educate uh the audience and in educating the audience don't go to educating the children go to educating the adults yeah because you just you you just can't call it an educational concert if you do that and i completely agree right Uh, and, and don't worry about an educational concert. Worry about uh, making new music accessible and do that through your social media stuff. Uh, interview living composers. I mean, bring them on. 
the composers who stick with us are those that were best at marketing themselves. And this is something that I, I am coming to, to believe um, very firmly is that you know the compos the living composers who are pl being played today are those that have the the best marketing strategy. They're not necessarily the composers who are the best, but they're the ones that market themselves the best. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess my my argument would be you know a lot of the best composers, the you know kind of like the the default orchestral composers that we think of. They were legitimate geniuses. Absolutely. And after but, the composers... But we died. have to acknowledge that there were many other equal geniuses that were ignored, glossed over over the years. And, you know, I, I feel like a, you were talking about educational concerts. One thing that we're going to have to do is bring new music to the forefront of orchestra concerts. Yes. Because... It is a sad but undeniable fact that if you're having an or if you have an orchestra concert that is ninety percent uh, music that was written during time periods where women and you know minorities were not included, it's going to by default exclude those yeah. composers because I mean, how many times can you perform? Fanny Mendelssohn or Clara Bike Schumann. Yeah, it, 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 with you know, when you're looking at composers like that, they don't translate well to um, orchestra music because they didn't write a lot of actual orchestral music. Well, I because mean, they wouldn't have been given the opportunity. They wouldn't have right. been allowed the opportunity to do so. I mean, they wrote smaller pieces because that's the pieces that they could they could hear performed. And we have to, you know, if it becomes, so like, you know, one kind of unfortunate trend in, in concerts is you have this concert and it's like two, like a, a big piano concerto that everybody knows and loves and then a big symphony that everybody knows and loves and then a new piece of music that happens to be written by a, a, a woman or a minority composer. So you haven't made any effort to, like you said, right. To, to build up the audience's appreciation of new music. So then you're just, it's, it's you're, a, it becomes a little bit pandering at that point. Well, it's setting up, it's setting up a piece to fail. And you, you're, Yes, I, I do believe that you have good intentions when you do that, but you have to take the extra step of not just – you can't present new music and take for granted that the audience is going to immediately get it, especially when you're juxtaposing it with, you know, I think someone else was saying, uh, Beethoven 5. Right. And so if you, you're performing Beethoven 5 – you don't expect the conductor to have to go out on stage and explain to the audience what they're about to hear. However, if you're going to go out... No, they almost always do. I actually really <laughs> enjoy that. I wish more conductors would talk in between uh, uh, the pieces. And, you know, talk to the audience and engage with them because that's one thing that classical music concerts absolutely lack is that audience interaction with the musicians on stage. You've got to have some of that. Uh, and the more you do that, the more engaging you become with the audience, the, the more audience retention you're going to have and the more adventurous stuff that you're going to be able to do because the audience is going to trust you yeah yeah and it, you know if, if if you're gonna break out of like we're really gonna as uh, orchestral musicians we are really gonna have to decide if we want to be a period ensemble yeah because if we don't do anything we are going to become a period ensemble by default. 
in, in some ways, many orchestras have. I, I remember several years ago, the, the Dallas Symphony Orchestra, uh, in their entire season, the most modern piece they played was the Firebird. Yep. And that's 1911. So they neglected to perform any music written in the past 100 years. I think uh, there may have been one Philip Glass piece in the entire season that, other than Firebird but there was nothing adventurous there was nothing new no minority or female composers and I think they got called out on it pretty hard too yeah and and you know having been in programming discussions the big chat the one of the one of the one of the issues you have to deal with is the programming that you're doing now is going to be judged three years down the road. Yeah. Because you have to make plans. So if you are reacting to, you know, demands for, you know, new music of, you know, a more inclusive group of composers, you're already late. Yes. Because... You know, the, the flyers have gone out, the programs have been printed, and you're committed to doing your, you know, pro, your program celebrating the 181st birthday of, you know, yeah. some, some composer. Yeah, and I don't mind orchestras having a, a theme to the whole season or to a particular concert. In fact, I kind of like it if it's, you know, cohesive and it tells a story. And, you know, I think you need to be doing that. I think you need to be telling stories with your programming. Uh, and that, again, will retain and enhance the audience. Um, so. Anyway, so yeah, back to the yeah, subcontract. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, we, we, we could, you know, get it. It could be getting something uh down a political rabbit hole at some point um you know it is you know as 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 mason brings up is it promoting my skill i absolutely i i actually think it is you know some of these composers like florence price um a fantastic composer i i want to hear more lily boulanger on on concerts because she was a fantastic yeah, so, composer. The problem with Lily Boulanger is most of her orchestral pieces are also um, with choir, which makes them much more difficult to program. Yeah, it's just it's important. I, I feel when you're discussing discussing earlier eras, it's important to draw a distinction between skill and skill plus marketing yeah. which i think is what you're getting at yeah or what you were getting at earlier and to, if we're looking at and we, i think take, that, that works much more for living composers right now because every living composer has the ability to be their own marketer it wasn't always that way in the past yeah yeah i just I had something I wanted to say, but... You hold your tongue. No, 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 no. I, I forgot it. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, no, yeah. I just assume I was going to say the most offensive thing you could think of. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I, I absolutely want... I want to see... If you, I want to see more living composers get performed. Number one, for program living composers, because if you're not doing that the art form will die. Two, the the playing field should be level for all composers of all skill, uh, uh, of the highest skill. That said, be, in the past, um, you know, compo minority composers, women composers, did not have the same opportunities uh, as is uh well the dead white male composers and yeah and, and see that, that that's really the big issue because i feel like I'll, and mason please don't don't i'm not trying to put words in your mouth i it's just this in a 
you do often hear the argument of you, you just have to pay attention to skill from people, you know, that are kind of arguing that it's it is important to when with a composer like Beethoven, you're not just talking about the genius. You're also talking about the position the combination of his genius and the benefits of not being a woman or, you know, a visible minority uh, afforded him over the years in getting his music performed, exposed, and to become a part of the cult, you know, part of the culture. So it, it's a combination of skills and frankly, privilege. Absolutely, it's a combination. The privilege is much more. Think about how many potential great composers we lost out on because they were not given the opportunity to... to and, we're, and we're never going to get those back. No. You know, there's, there's nothing we can... As long as we are playing music from exclusively from the 1800s, Mm -hmm. we're, we're, that's not a, an, a issue we can rectify. Right. We don't have a body of literature from female composers. We don't have a body of literature from uh, non-white composers from that era. And, and, and even if, and what literature we do have was not exposed to the wider culture to kind of organically develop in the same way that the music of Beethoven was, and not to discount his his genius at all. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think the 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 one relevant aspect of all of this to the subject is that new music is good, and we should support new music. And you know, I I, I would also add that it's important to keep in mind that things are much better for women and minority composers now than they were but even now we're not there there are still obstacles there are still you know old old you know like old stuffy you know white guys sitting in the orchestra oh, saying yeah. well you know i just don't know about this composer because it's not what i grew up with and whether it's you know purpose conscious sexism or you know subconscious sexism that is still there mm -hmm. it's better it's improving and hopefully it continues to improve but you know it it's not just a matter of of catching up yeah because yeah. you know like i sometimes you'll hear the argument of well, things are fine now. We just need to, you know, wait in a couple centuries while, you know, everything catches up. Because, you know, we're still dealing with, you know, most, you know, someone talked before about copyright. It's a simple, unavoidable fact that like 95% of orchestral music written by women is under copyright. Yeah. It's uh, that absolutely. You're, you're right there. Uh, it, an orchestra can't go out and play that music without, you know, going through the, the, the publishers. And so it's less financially uh, viable for them to do that when they can go and get the great masterworks for free. Or, you know, it may be like uh, in the case of Florence Price, you know, her music largely existed in manuscript form. It had to be turned in to orchestral parts. I know because I was one of the people who was hired to do some of it. Um, you know, that, that music didn't, even if it's a an orchestra wanted to play it, they couldn't just go out and buy the parts for it. Right. You know, you know I, I've run across that with uh, some, some more obscure composers I've looked into. It's like, I would love to study this music. Oh, it's all in manuscript form. No one's ever touched it. Uh, and so you yeah. can't play it. Yeah. Well, anyway. Yeah, we've been going two and a half hours at this point. <laughs> hey, but to be fair, at least 45 minutes of it was on topic. Hey, yeah. 
but uh, yeah, I, I'm surprised there's still 13 people watching this. Oh, it, the, yeah, but you know, at least you know, three of them are you know, getting ready to write you know something in the comments. Oh, no, I'm that, sure. Yeah. Now that yeah. I, I, I I'm joking. Our Brett and I's audience would never do something like that. Your audience <laughs> might not. I've had some some mean comments. Yeah, well, you 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 have a, a larger constituency of. Um, I have uh, a lot of more composers who think they know better than they do. And, and composer, yeah. composers tend to to be very full of themselves, and myself included. Myself, absolutely included. Um, so, the what the the big advantage my channel has is. It's hard to to go to my channel to open up the the first page and and think that I don't have a sense of humor. Right. <laughs> humor. Yeah. You know, my it, sense of humor uh, does not come through a lot of times, and that that I think is a detriment on my part. Well, and and you know it it's different when you're a performer and a composer. You know, people expect. Yeah, there's a different air that you're expected to convey. You know, people don't go to my channel and think, you know, this is someone who really takes himself seriously. And as a composer, you have to be that. Yeah, unless you're writing humorous music, and I don't, I can't really write humorous, silly music. It's not really part of who I am. I mean, most of my music lately just, you know, revolves around, you know, you know, I, I, as you may have heard earlier, it's it's much darker music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas, you know, if in my situation, I get paid to play the sub, the, the contra bassoon. That is my job. Yeah. So most of the time people don't come to my channel thinking, oh, I'm, I'm going to try to pr push this guy's buttons. Yeah. So, but oh. I, I guess I guess you know it's only a matter of time. Having said that, somewhere someone's gonna to to go and try 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 to find a uh, a a tr uh, an avenue for trolling. But you know. Yeah. But I think we should probably wrap it up. Um, I've got a pot roast yep. that I need to get uh, on the stove to cook in. Well, thank you for hosting this. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. Like I said, a full forty-five minutes of it were on topic, oh, at uh, least, but it was at least, yeah. It was ended up being more of a free-form rant, but you know, yeah. rants are okay. Yeah, and I've got some things to talk to you uh, off offline, so we can continue there. So, okay. All right. All right. Well, Sounds good. Thank you guys for listening to us ramble. <laughs>